Welcome to our webinar on navigating EU founding opportunities for libraries. In this session, we will explore how libraries can align with the European Union's priorities, grasp key concepts and position themselves for EU funds. To navigate the EU ecosystem, it's important to understand its core focuses. Today, we will focus on digitalization, active citizenship, inclusion and the Green Deal. Digitalization refers to integrating digital technologies into various aspects of society, enhancing services and innovation. Active citizenship involves citizens participating in their communities, exercising democratic rights and making a positive impact. Inclusion aims to provide equal opportunities and promote social cohesion, embracing diversity and accessibility. The Green Deal is the EU's ambitious initiative to achieve climate neutrality, combat climate change and foster sustainability. Libraries are ideal candidates for EU funds as they are essential community hubs that can align with these priorities. They play a pivotal role in promoting digitalization by providing technology access, digital resources and digital literacy training. Libraries also foster active citizenship by offering civic education resources, organizing community engagement events and promoting informed decision making. Contributing to the Green Deal, libraries raise awareness, provide resources on sustainability and implement eco-friendly practices. In terms of inclusion, libraries offer inclusive spaces, diverse collection and resources catering to different backgrounds, abilities and languages. By embracing these EU priorities and showcasing their impact, libraries become attractive candidates for EU founding programs such as SERV, Erasmus Plus and Creative Europe. Today we will speak with four guests. Svere Helge Bolstadt, Bergen Public Library Technology and Learning Department Head and Epale Norway Ambassador, leading the Connectable Innovating Social and Digital Inclusion Project under Erasmus+. Plus. Filipa Baros Belem, Municipality Library Coordinator in Lisbon with expertise in coordinating library activities and driving participatory processes for internationalization efforts. Maya Wunschek, Director of Krain City Library, actively collaborating internationally, participating in EU projects and holding leadership roles in library associations. Sitzel Beck Patterson, former library transformer in Orhaus, now Head of Innovation and Co-Creation at Orhaus Public Libraries, involved in projects and promoting user involvement, including the development of the Design Thinking for Libraries Toolkit. Let's start with digitalization and Svere Helge Bolstadt. The last 10 years have seen increasing recognition of public libraries as providers of basic digital skills training and places where people can freely access the internet. Digitalization of collections and the issues of open access are now widespread. In addition, e-leading is becoming an increasingly common service for public libraries across the EU. Recently, the digitalization process got two very different boosts. First, COVID, which forced people to access different services remotely while they slowly got used to them, so a lot of digital solutions are here to stay. The other recent event is the appearance of AI assistants that can be useful in libraries as well, but new technologies brings new challenges. 46% of Europeans reported last year to encounter untrue or doubtful content online. Libraries are the cornerstone of reliable information in our society, but library staff often lack digital skills and AI knowledge. The need for a mind shift to data literacy is more important than ever. EU funds offer a variety of options to improve data management, digital skills of all generations, understanding privacy issues and at the same time preventing widespread misinformation.
Svere Helge Bolstadt is Department Head of Technology and Learning at Bergen Public Library and an IPALE Norway Ambassador. The library aims to be a relevant arena for, for public education and lifelong learning and is active in several EU-founded projects and leads the project Connectable, Innovating Social and Digital Inclusion under the Erasmus Plus Programme Strategic Partnership. Hello and welcome to our webinar. Let's start with the first question. So why is it important for libraries to focus on promoting digital literacy and digitalization among their users and how can they do that? Um, I think digital skills are essential for full participation in modern society. So I think we need skills both to use and communicate with public services and authorities, but also to communicate with our families and friends and for our well-being. So taking part in culture and in civic life in our communities, we need the basic skills. So I think digital literacy uh, are necessary to, to be able to find and understand and use the information online today. And libraries are natural places for this kind of literacy training. So in Bergen, we, we do this in many ways. We offer learning opportunities through classes and workshops and also one-on-one -on -one, one guidance to help users learn basic skills uh, and use digital tools and resources. And we also give access to computers and to the internet and digital resources, ensuring that citizens have access to information and technology. And I think, especially now, when tools get more powerful, uh, it's even more important to try to fight this digital divide. Um, for example, AI uh, that can help people solve many tasks. Uh, and I think it's a technology that will touch us all and will have big implications for how we work and communicate and uh, solve stuff. Uh, can be a uh, something that will make even a bigger divide uh, between those who know how to use it and master it and those who, who don't. So uh, I think we have a role also, not giving only basic skills, but to help citizens understand more advanced technologies. And uh, sometimes we're talking about democratizing technology, like to make it accessible and understandable. Uh, what is it? How can it be used? And what consequences does it have for our society? So I think then the library can, can offer it so you can come and try it. For example, VR technology or learn how, how AI are working. But I think also we need to like discuss the consequences um, through like talks and debates. And uh, uh, yeah, because AI raises a lot of big questions and the library can be a place to explore these questions in, in many, many ways, yeah. How can libraries contribute to building a more engaged and participatory society through initiatives uh, centered around digital literacy? Uh, I think we can empower individuals to actively participate in the digital world. So to do this, I think we have to make it less scary try to make it fun and social and organize workshops and seminars and training sessions that teach skills in a creative way. Uh, and we have to try to, to encourage people to also create, create digital content. For example, we have a podcast studio and a makerspace uh, and giving access to, to software to create stuff. So I think we need to, to make uh, the citizens uh, be able to be like producers and, and not only users or consumer of, uh, of uh, digital resources, but also how to create and express themselves through the tools. So I think we can facilitate like community engagement by hosting coding clubs like we do now, uh, run by the library or by volunteers and uh, facilitate, uh, have facili facilitate like studio or makerspaces, media labs, and encourage digital culture. 
So what are the potential benefits and outcomes of fostering digitalization within library settings? I think as a business, of course, we can do automatization stuff and make, make our services uh, as self-services and use digitalization in this way as a business and maybe save time and money that we can use on the patrons themselves offering new services or better services. Uh, and I also think they can, we can use it to announce the efficiency of our services and support this move from, from like paper or analog media to e-media for e-books and audiobooks and film streaming uh, and so on. So I think to, to meet the requirements and expectation for the users, I think we have to transform and meet them on the platforms that they expect. Uh, yeah, and I think also digitalization is very important for the library's work with communication, how we can reach out and reach new target groups and be visible in another way than earlier. Um, and of course, also digitalization uh, means that we can make more resources accessible. For example, our national library are digitizing uh, all cultural heritage stuff and every, actually everything that is being printed in Norway is being digitalized and made available uh, by the National Library. So the National Library makes this accessible through their website nettbiblioteke.no but some of the stuff because of copyright you have to come to the public library to get access to. So this is uh, I think is uh, important so one thing I maybe miss or I haven't seen yet is uh, libraries being able to take this role as a meeting place, as a social space, and uh, take this into the online world. So we are not really a digital meeting place. We're not a, like a communication platform for citizens where they can share knowledge and ideas in a digital way. So we are still very physically in this way offering digital services and some some like spaces but not i think we have a potential to to enter the digital world what specific programs or resources can libraries utilize to bring more awareness around digital literacy do you have some concrete examples for us can you share a something more about your project, Connectable, Innovating Digital and Social Inclusion. Yes, this project uh, is called Connectable and it's funded by the Erasmus Plus program. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this project, we very much explore how libraries can activate local partners uh, in our work with creating digital creative learning opportunities and also work with social inclusion in the same time. So I think uh, partnerships, like local partnerships, are very important to reach participants, like to recruit participants to our programs and understand the target group. Uh, and also for, for funding and uh, the opportunities for uh, applying for funds together with the relevant organizations. Uh, so one concrete example was when we worked with a a local high school where the students studied uh, like uh, computer science and ICT service. And another partner was the Pensionnaire Association here in Bergen and a school for newcomers or immigrants. And we made different learning opportunities combining uh, actual help with problems they had, but also introducing them to create uh, more creative technology like 3D printing and uh, virtual reality. So uh, in this partnership, the high school students that will learn how to offer like user support got a, a, a big win because they had to practice how to explain these concepts, how to make uh, the senior citizens find the resources and how to use it. And of course, the senior citizens got the help finding out uh, how to solve their problems. So this is a way to, to activate the community because the library itself doesn't have a lot of resources to, to do these learning opportunities, but we can connect and uh, make it uh, 
available in this uh, way. So just to mention another thing in this project is that we, we saw like creativity as a basic skill uh, in itself. And I think to be creative or exploratory in approaching digital tools is very important in how to learn, how to use them. Um, so to be able to, to find and uh, apply new ideas on how to solve things is very important. So I think learning technology should be fun. Uh, we should try to, 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 to uh, uh, how to say, share and transfer this interest or joy in working with technology to those who, who need to learn it. How can libraries incorporate digital approaches into their existing services and programs? I think maybe one way that we're trying to do or something that can be an idea is to use uh, the library's own digital services as a means for learning. For example, we learn visitors how to use our library app to search and loan books or an app on how to read ebooks. So we use our own digital services to learn how to like log in or to search or to find stuff. So that can be one way. And I think the, the big thing is maybe to include digital culture, like gaming, electronic literature, social media, as a natural play, place in the library. And this is part of our culture in the same way as literature or music or arts. And we have to include it in our program and services. Um, for example, a workshop that we're working with now, that we're planning, it's based on AI. So we will use uh, ChatGPT or similar AI technology and Midjourney uh, to make a, a workshop for young adults to create a book together. So uh, they will uh, we will also engage a, a writer, an author, and uh, they will explore how they can use AI and prompts to create the story and to create the imagery of the book uh, through this workshop. So the final result will be a book that we know very well in the library. But in this uh, project, we will co-create the content and the story together with the, uh, the young adults. So this is a way of using technology also within the domain that we work, uh, usually. What strategies can libraries employ to raise awareness and educate their leaders about the importance of digitalization? Um, of course, I think we can showcase success stories and especially the impact that it has on individuals if they get help and if they uh, master digital tools to solve issues in their lives and what this means for social inclusion and for cohesion and trust in our communities. And also, I think we can try to showcase the meaning of libraries and this work we do with digital skills, what it means for democracy, that everyone can participate and the access to information, of course, and to know how to use the tools. It's a, like a prerequisite for participation. So if we can manage to tell this story in a way, I think it will make an impact. And then I need, uh, the, I think the leaders need to understand that the libraries with their network and partnerships are very important infrastructure in our society. Uh, and we're not only infrastructure, but we're also very much an interface to the citizens. So if our leader really appreciates this, I think, uh, and then when I talk about leader, I talk about politicians and authorities and the government. Uh, I think they could see the libraries as a really important uh, uh, platform for working with digital exclusion. So this digital first society that we have, that the, like, the communication between the authorities and the citizens should be digital, in the first place. Uh, now I feel libraries is like the first line of support for the citizens when they need some help. And I don't think we really have been given this mandate or role or the funding to, to solve this uh, issue. 
So I think the, the issue of digital exclusion has to be solved like across sectors, interdisciplinary, and libraries are an important part of that. And one last point about that is I think not everyone will become digital. So I think someone will always need a physical place to go uh, to be able to solve their issues. And I think maybe libraries can be that place. Are there any collaborative projects or partnerships that libraries can engage in to enhance their efforts in promoting digitalization? There are several uh, places and projects. I think like local partnerships that I just talked about is able is uh, one way. I like collaborate with community organizations that work with the same issues. Uh, we have. Uh, example of this, like locally in Bergen. Uh, and I also think we have some good national partnerships. We have uh, one initiative called DigiDel, uh, which is a resource run by the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills. So it's a website with resources for those who work with teaching basic digital skills. So it's like uh, ready made PowerPoints that you can use to teach uh, some. Uh, skills and also like simulations of uh, uh, online banking so you can have a simulation to try so you can use this in your library when you want to to teach basic skills so we are part of this editorial group in this initiative and we are also part of a metro libraries network in norway with the 10 biggest cities work together and there we have a sub network of people who work with digital inclusion and learning especially and so that's on the national level and international uh, we are part of epali this electronic platform for adult learning in europe uh, so it's a, a online platform where we share resources there are blog posts there are a partner search where you can find partners across europe to to, to search for funding together with and it's also a lot of articles so projects will post their reports there and uh, it's a lot of interesting stuff there so uh, there are some libraries there but we need more libraries to join this Epali platform so we can collaborate there also yes are there founding opportunities or grants available to libraries that specifically support initiatives related to the digitalization and digital literacy uh, yes, so we work a lot with the project with external funding to develop these services. Um, and there are governmental grants. So just recently we had uh, money from the Directorate of Health to work with seniors and health apps. Um, and there are also other like uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Uh, where we had some funding for some project to work with partners within adult learning uh, and we have the national library of norway which uh, annually give funding to development projects in libraries so this is an opportunity we used several times and then we apply money from private foundations so like jensidia stiftelsen uh, kavlifonda sparebank stiftelsen Bank. In Norway, there are different private funding where we get money for projects working with, especially with uh, uh, underserved groups. Yeah, and then also on the EU level, uh, we have been part in several uh, projects. Uh, now we are being the beneficiary of this uh, connectable project that I talked about, where we have partners from Denmark and Belgium. Um, so yeah we have been part of maybe five or six or seven uh, erasmus plus projects and also one project about electronic literature which was founded by creative europe so i think there are possibilities uh, the problems of thing often being you get funding for a year or two to develop a service or try out something and then the the funding ends so uh, then we have to, to make it part of our regular operation if it really is a successful project. 
Thank you very much and all the best with your future projects. The principles of equality and inclusiveness are part of the core values of the EU and are enshrined in the EU treaties. In all its activities, the Union shall observe the principle of the equality of its citizens who shall receive equal attention from all its institutions, bodies, offices and agencies. Societies are increasingly diverse in many respects. Cultures, abilities, social groups, sexualities, political opinions, identities, education, training, literacy levels. People with fewer opportunities are people who, for economic, social, cultural, geographical or health reasons due to their migrant background or for reasons such as disability or educational difficulties or for any other reason, face obstacles that prevent them from having effective access to opportunities. This results in a greater need to learn to navigate diversity. Throughout Europe, public libraries have a proud tradition of welcoming everyone. For example, with the ongoing war in Ukraine, the European Bureau of Library Information and Documentation Association has called upon his tradition of libraries to give a warm welcome, a safe place to Ukrainian refugees during these difficult times. Libraries are open to everyone and in a modern world such inclusive places are more important than ever. Filipa Baros is currently the Belém Municipal Library Coordinator at Camara Municipal de Lisboa. She has rich experience in the coordination of the library's activities and the development of participatory processes for the Lisbon Library Network's internalization efforts. Welcome to our webinar. Let's start with the first question. Why is it important for libraries to focus on promoting inclusion among their users and how can they do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I would like to, to say that uh, here in the Lisbon uh, Library Network where I work, uh, before this webinar, I was talking with my colleague uh, that has the, um, she coordinates a, a service that's about inclusion, about also her, her perspective. Uh, she doesn't really speak uh, uh, fluently uh, English, so she's not here with me, but uh, I've revised a bit the ideas with her also because I have an experience here in a library that I work, but we have the lucky, uh, very precious uh, thing of having a, a whole team that is dedicated to inclusion. And talking about this importance, uh, we both think that, um, I mean, it's really a question of uh, human rights, it's a question of uh, cultural democracy, and uh, because we don't, uh, we, we are always saying that libraries are open to everyone or to anyone, so if we don't want that to be only words, we really, it should be business as usual. It should be something as organic as breathing or as just everyday life working to work towards inclusion because we have a plural world. So uh, we shouldn't have to justify or to argument around that. But we know that's not, that's not the case. It's still, there's so many things to be done. And if we don't want this to be like empty words, we really have to, to, to do an extra step on commitment, uh, to get the commitment of our uh, directions, of every leaders, and, and to get the awareness of, of the, the really, um, uh, truly uh, daily thing that this should all be. Because we are only reflecting, if we are a community, serving institutions, we can only be institutions that are reflecting our community. And our community, if, if we go outside, if we go to the streets, what we find is diversity, it's plural, plurality. We do not find people equal uh, everywhere. We find different people. So the importance is that, is that if we want to be vibrant, if we want to be relevant, if we want to exist for everyone, 
that's the only way to work. It's to, to, to work with that focus, to work with everyone. It doesn't matter how different it is from everyone. How can libraries contribute to building a more engaged and participatory society through initiatives centered around inclusion? Yeah, that's, that's another thing because, uh, yeah, we, we, could, we can center them around inclusion, but we, I think the focus for us is to, um, that everything is done like that, no? Because we recognize we are diverse, we are plural, so it's not to be centering something on inclusion, it's just to be centering something on the community that we have, for example, no? So, yeah, the, the thing about engaged and participatory uh, society, it's very important because, um, we cannot reflect the communities we, if we don't work closely with them. And I think the better way that the library can do that is um, for once go to this, uh, for starters, go to the streets and, and really be and know and map out in your community. Don't stay inside because inside only comes in a certain amount of people and, and, and maybe people that are already more prone to read or more attentive to, you know, certain uh, uh, values that we share. But we have to go outside and we have to, to um, show that everyone can come in. Uh, and, and also we have to know who, who are we working for. Uh, so that's, that's very important to go outside and to start building inside uh, in our networks of libraries a system and, a, and um, yeah, a systemic way of working that has to do with sharing of the power, with co collaborate, with collaboration, with co uh, programming. You know that we do not offer things; we build things together. So I think the key is that is the sharing of power, the sharing of the management in, in of the library, if we can. So for me, for example, it's very important. The, the thing I'm most focused on, and and the thing I think has been giving um, much more um, uh, results is the fact that I tend to say yes to everything that, uh, to, to every even strange proposal that comes in or, or that I found, find on the streets. So things that we usually would say, oh my God, no, maybe this is, uh, maybe this is too stretch, uh, too, too much of a stretch for us as an institution, but I tend to make the exercise of saying yes and then finding how to how we will we manage as a crew, as a network to make that possible. That is my goal. And I think that's that's really the way the way to go. Then of course, if we do this, if we really um, open up, if we go to the streets, if we meet up, if we build those relationships and they are going to become uh, emotional and neighborhood uh, relationships, you know, uh, they're going to be like having a neighbor, having a friend outside. So if we do that, then I think you will see that inside the library, mm, it's much easier to, you know, to host debates that are true, that are honest, that really share uh, different points of view because people are not menaced by that encounter inside the library. Uh, you can position yourself as, as such. You can position as, yourself as, as a place where you will always find different perspectives. And, and this is not only rhetorics, this is not only theoretics, it will become true if you do that. It will become really tangible to see. And, and you will see that uh, user, users will be, will be feeling represented and, um, and you can really position yourself as a get together uh, place where people meet and, and, and where also you can, something very, very important that happens uh, through that is that you can fight uh, the misconceptions and, uh, and the lies that some people have about different kinds of people of their own, no? so people that are different from, from their own. Uh, realities and and you can fight that because people need they can see that uh, you know there's so many things that uh, are not true that you have in your misconception so you're fighting against discrimination very actively so I think yeah there's a really there's a really strong point to be made about that positioning of libraries 
in, uh, as, as institutions that really can foster engagement and plural societies and more democratic ones. Yeah. And what are the potential benefits and outcomes of fostering inclusion within library settings? Mm -hmm. So I think the benefits it's, yeah, I think you will have much more vibrant house. I really tend to look at, uh, at the library as a house, you know? Yes, we are libraries, we have books, we, we still work very much around uh, lending books and uh, around collection, but you're also a house with rooms and with, with something that is so precious, which, which is your daily, daily life. This is something that we have very different for, for example, from museums or from other kinds of institutions that user, users go there with the goal to see an exhibition or, and they come in and they come out very, very precisely, no? very surgically almost. But here in the libraries, you know that we have, I mean, people that come here and stay all day and they have lunch and they have, and they, they take out their shoes to read or to work and they do their master degrees or they are just sheltering because they are in a situation of homelessness. So really, I think if you work really honestly engaging with that, with that value of, of plurality or um, inclusion, then you will find your, your house will be very vibrant will be, uh, yeah, very relevant. Because if not, you will only have these same kinds of people coming in. And, and the outcomes, I think, um, yeah, you will have a different uh, and more diverse uh, audiences for everything you, you do. You have different conversations. You will be able to change yourself and to change the way that you manage. It's really, it's really just... Uh, every, evolving as a relationship um, and you will, I think again people will feel much more represented different kinds of people they will feel their that house is for themselves to to use as them and to you know to engage with they won't feel excluded I mean uh, that's that's the point no what specific programs or resources can libraries utilize to be more inclusive? Do you have some concrete examples for us, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it will depend a lot on, on, on the reality of each library or, or of each network. It will depend on, on the budgeting and on the you know, investment that the country has to its cultural you know, uh, institutions, because we are cultural institutions. So I imagine the reality will be very different from place to place, from country to country, or, or even from region to region. But from our experience, we worked to, uh, with the municipality of Lisbon. Uh, and I can tell you that now, uh, for example, uh, our network, uh, because our leader, our head of the, of the network is very, engage with, uh, for example, one of the things is the um, uh, language discrimination that is coming out as a, as a complaint uh, of several uh, immigrant uh, communities. Uh, and this is something that we relate so much because we are libraries, we are all about also uh, about language, we are all about, you know, sharing uh, language. And so this is something that we need to, to work with, and we are doing that. We're working to fight with these kinds of manifestation of language discrimination. We are positioning ourselves like that. But also, for example, one of the uh, one or two of the, the libraries of this network has um, lots of uh, shows that are um, interpreted by uh, Portuguese uh, sign language in, in the shows. Um, we have uh, partnerships with, uh, with uh, uh, platforms of um, black artists that are helping us to revise the history of some of the buildings or even the collection. We are working with feminist uh, platforms that are creating uh, uh, some parts of, the, of our collection so that they can reflect these parts of the collections can reflect the, the, the feminist uh, or even equal um, equality of gender um, thoughts, no, and 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 
we also have worked with the LGBTI uh, Association of Portugal with many, many projects, but uh, one of them was to create a better indexation, a glossary that is really well adapted uh, with the contemporary world and the contemporary language. And, and this indexation can uh, uh, improve a lot our catalog when people are looking for terms. Uh, we also had a, an experience that was very interesting, which was uh, postcards. Uh, this was made also with this association, and these postcards uh, were uh, had some um, some terms or expressions around gender, for example, gender, gender identity, and what it is different from gender um, uh, from you know from from uh, from different from all these diverse gender expressions and that people feel very confused about. So these postcards were uh, trying to get, give people information generically. And it, it, it was a, a very interesting project because uh, we found so many people even inside now. We ourselves have so sometimes are confused with this terminology. So that was also a good partnership. And we, we always uh, partner with the, the, the two major, um, well, one of the, the major associations that work around access, which is uh, Access Culture and uh, Access Lab. And, and both of them uh, are really close partners uh, that can help us think, for example, things about mobility, uh, I mean, accessibility, uh, physical accessibility in the buildings, or um, accessibility of the programs that we host, etc. And also, also uh, with the publishers that have, for example, uh, publishers that have um, uh, inclusive books, which is, you know, a very uh, broad um, concept. But they they work around levels of inclusive, uh, inclusiveness. And we, we work with this, those publishers now to try to get those books to our collections, for example. How can libraries incorporate inclusive approaches into their existing services and programs? So uh, if, we, if we can, and depending on the budget, it would be, I think, we, we think that it's a good practice to, to, when you're budgeting, when you're doing your, you know, your programs for the year, if you can include, for example, uh, subtitling some of the shows or um, sign languages for some of the shows, or even audio description. And that's something that, of course, it has a cost. It, it should have a cost, so you should be prepared for that. That already goes a long way. Um, you, can, you can also focus on, for example, just sticking with, uh, with performances and activities. You can host some uh, relaxed performances, which are performances that are much more uh, loose in terms of rules of movement and noise. In the audience, and that can um, be much more pleasurable uh, and interesting for so many uh, different audiences. Uh, you can think about design, design, and, and also the I don't know if you say cinematics, you know, the, the, the way that you um, say uh, inform people where is the directions of things. You can use pictograms. I mean, there's there's so many ways that you can really. Uh, include on, on, on programs or, or management that you already have, you can include some, some aspects that will broaden the, the, the scope of the, the people that you invite in. Um, and always, always try to, to, I think we have been doing that and it's, it's really, it's pleasurable and it's interesting and it makes us advance and, and improve, which is to work closely with people uh, and with, with associations and with uh, communities that represent people that are not feeling represented in our libraries and, and share with them our, our doubts or even the things that we thought and letting people to destroy that and point the errors and just uh, hold on to that as a very positive thing. Just um, recognizing your mistakes and your, you know, you have the power to 
think something ahead, but you don't represent everyone. So you should uh, share all that uh, you're thinking with the broader audience you can, or at least with your community. And language-wise and programming-wise, just do a trial with that and see what you can improve. What strategies can libraries employ to raise awareness and educate their leaders about the importance of inclusion? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very interesting uh, question because leadership is something that is being also um, a target of, of thought nowadays. And I'm, I'm very glad that it is like that because we are very, very accustomed to um, hierarchies that are very fixed and that don't change and, that, and they're very long. And so that's, that's a question allows us to think a little bit about leadership and again about the power that leaders have. So for us, it's very important to, to do, I mean, I mean, it's all about training, right? It's about meeting up and training and, and, and debating around leaders and trying to get leaders to, sh to share the stage also or, or the, the room with, with very different kinds of people with the, all the, our, our partners and, and just try to, 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 to improve your listening, to improve your skills around so many things. I mean, you can train leaders on non-discrimination, on, on participation, on how you can be a leader that uh, shares your, your power and that can really truly co-produce, co-manage with the community. It's not easy, it's not. And we all say that we want to do that, but, uh, but we really really need to be ready to do that. It's, it's very challenging, but it is what gives the better outcomes, I, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, from, from my experience, it's the way to go. Also, you can inform and train leaders about language because or else you have leaders that are still using languages, that language or terminologies that are not contemporary or that are um, uh, problematic or that can uh, hurt someone. So that is something very basic also that, that all the leaders can really think about language they are using. Um, on bibliodiversity, we, we have been doing that also, the, this, this kind of thought about different kinds of books that are much more caring much more for you know the ones that are represented on the books and the ways that even the format of the book so all the bibliodiversity landscape it's something very interesting also for leaders to to think about and in our network we we gave a major step a strategic step uh, this year which was to build up a team of inclusion uh, and this team is, is uh, working with every library of the network. It's a central team that works and, and gets training for every, every library of this uh, network here, around 17 libraries. And, and this team, if I have a doubt, I can call my, my colleague Isabel, which is the, the, the coordinator of this team, and I can ask her and she can give me, you know, all kinds of... Uh, of information and she can put me in contact with some uh, important or major partners and so on. I think that's very strategic to have. And also it's a statement. It's a statement of the, of the network to say we have a, a team that's working on, on inclusion, inclusion so that maybe in five years we don't need the team. This is the goal, right? That would be uh, utopia, but uh, I think utopia is also a very important thing to get uh, strategically, to be able to dream and dream together. Yeah. Are there any collaborative projects or partnerships that libraries can engage in to enhance their efforts in promoting inclusion? Um, Yeah, I think, yeah, the partnerships are, you know, the most uh, important things and you can work, yeah, a partnership can be with a citizen or it can be with an association and we can tell you experiences, yeah, like uh, the, the association of uh, LGBTI plus uh, uh, of Portugal and that with, with whom we made all these uh, projects that I told you about. 
we also i think another another interesting uh, area with is journalism here in lisbon we have some some um, new uh, community um, uh, uh, journalists and community papers uh, they are doing a very different kind of, uh, of uh, information and, and journalism. And this is, uh, this is a good partnership, I think, for libraries, because they are very well trained people that are also training people inside the community to be, uh, to, to be the voices of the, of the community. So it's, it's very interesting to get uh, there. I don't know if everyone has this reality, but it's an interesting area. Um, and whenever you can, for example, uh, also some, somewhat utopic for some countries or for some realities, but uh, very, very important if you can do it, is to think uh, from the beginning, if you have the, the, the opportunity to build up a, a new library from scratch, then to involve all these associations and even the architects to think about all these aspects of, of uh, inclusiveness. Uh, around uh, or accessibility around physical aspects or even you know systemic aspects you can make uh, partnerships with communities that can help you decide what kinds of, um, of programming it would be interesting to to host in these new libraries and and to think and, and really dream what that new library can be but already with the foundation of uh, togetherness and, and plur pluralness, right? So this this is something that if 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 you can do, it's it's I think it's uh, it's very it's very uh, strong. It's very strong. Then you have wonderful results because the the relationships that are built from the beginning and people can you know see the project uh, growing from the beginning is a really really strong relation. Yeah. Are there funding opportunities or grants available to libraries that specifically support initiatives related to inclusion? Yeah, yeah. We we um, I mean we know know of some, but there are, some of them are local. For example, this Access Culture is a, is an association, a Portuguese association, and they give prizes for. Uh, the projects with the clear languages or the projects with better um, accessibility. Uh, so these prizes are incentives and there are opportunities of funding other things, for example. Uh, there are other associations in Portugal that uh, also fund uh, something that is very interesting, which is co-programming uh, with citizens. Uh, there's a project that, um, to create like a council of citizens that uh, work with the libraries to um, choose which, uh, which performances would be interesting to bring in to the library in the year that will come. Um, there was a project that we, we followed closely, which was also Access Culture was involved, which was Every Story Matters. And they still have a lot of resources online. Uh, you can check that out, but I don't think they give, uh, you know, they give any kind of uh, funding or grant right now. But uh, it is a resource that is very interesting and very rich. Um, and also the Europe Challenge. I don't know if you know that, but um, I don't think they are. Uh, I think they're. A bit uh, generic, you know, because what they aim to, I think, is to cross the crossovers between citizens and communities and libraries or other institutions, I think. So, uh, but that is the, the founding of the thing. So maybe they don't speak about inclusion necessarily, but, but they are speaking about it anyway, because they are uh, investing on this cross, uh, on this relationship, very close relationship. And, and they, they do found, uh, they do have uh, uh, some funding for or some grants uh, for, for libraries. And I think it's open now, the, the, or it will be open soon for the next year. You can check that, that out, the Europe Challenge. But of course, there should be so many other opportunities. Uh, 
European wise, for example, but I, we don't, uh, we're not working uh, now with, uh, with uh, any one of uh, these fundings. Thank you for all your thoughts and all the best in your future projects. Active citizenship is all about individuals participating in their communities and making a positive impact. Libraries play a crucial role in fostering active citizenship. For a long time, libraries are no longer just a place to borrow books. They are important community building spaces as they empower individuals to become informed and engaged citizens. Libraries provide information and organize events and workshops on various topics from civic education to environmental sustainability. These activities encourage active participation, inspire citizens to take action and exercise their democratic rights. The library can offer a place where visitors can carry out activities and meet like-minded people because libraries also serve as meeting spaces for community groups, enabling citizens to come together, share ideas and collaborate on projects that improve their neighborhoods. For example, in Finland, Helsinki Central Library Odi is open every day of the week as a meeting place, providing visitors with knowledge, new skills and stories. It's a place for learning, relaxation and work. A similar example of good practice is the Danish Aarhus University Library and more and more libraries throughout Europe are following such good examples. Maya Wunschek is a highly accomplished librarian with extensive international engagement and experience employed at Kran City Library since 1999, currently holding the position of director. She actively collaborates with professional institutions abroad, participates in EU projects, and she has held various leadership roles in library associations and initiatives, showcasing her commitment and advancing the field of librarianship. Welcome to our webinar. So let's start with this. Why is it important for libraries to focus on promoting active citizenship among their users? Uh, libraries are safe and trusted spaces in the local community for everyone. Libraries encourage inclusion, creating active partnership by empowering libraries. We better understand and support the development of local civic society. They promote active citizenship with providing access to information and culture for all people, regard regardless of their background, beliefs, or status. Libraries help people develop information literacy skills that enable them to locate, access, evaluate, interpret, and act on information to participate in community affairs and public life. With communication technologies, they engage citizens uh, in civic activities and inclusion. Libraries also support education for citizenship by offering resources, programs, and services that encourage lifelong learning and critical thinking. How can libraries contribute to building a more engaged and participatory society through initiatives centered around active citizenship? They can contribute by encouraging civic engagement and active citizenship among their users and communities. They can do this by providing resources, programs and services that support civic education, civic literacy, civic dialogue and civic action. They can also collaborate with schools, faculties, students and different community partners to design and uh, implement service learning projects that address local and global issues. Libraries have their spaces, collections, and technologies to facilitate deliberation, discussion, and debate on public issues and to foster a culture of the democracy. Libraries can also advocate for the right to culture, the right to information, and the right to participant for all people, especially under represented groups. 
What are the potential benefits and outcomes of fostering active citizenship within library settings? Some potential benefits and outcomes of fostering active citizenship within library settings are, let's say, improving the civic literacy and civic competence of library users and communities, which can help them make informed decisions, participate in public affairs and exercise their rights and responsibilities. The next one is strengthening the social capital and social connection of library users and communities, which can foster trust, collaboration, and mutual support among diverse groups and individuals. Promoting the culture diversity and inter cultural dialogue of library users and communities, which can enrich their cultural expression, respect their differences and protect their heritage. Uh, then supporting the economic development and uh, in, uh, innovation of library users and communities, which can rise their skills, employability and creativity. Demonstrating the value and impact of libraries as public institutions that contribute to the common good, democracy and social justice. And civic literacy and competence are important for developing a sense of civic identity, civic responsibility and civic efficiency among individuals and communities. They also enable people to contribute to social change, change econom, economic development and cultural diversity. What specific programs or resources can libraries utilize to empower individuals and encourage their active involvement in civic life? Community partnership uh, have the power to meet your library strategic goals, expand your uh, reach and amplify what's great in your community. Libraries can help to achieve its aspirations by creating partnership built on solid relationships, mutual respect and smart goals. Libraries can play an important role in promoting civic engagement and empowering individuals to participate in civic life. But we can see different situation around the world. In Slovenia, it is not common to raise money in the library. More or less libraries organize educational and informational events or discussion groups about health, food science, media literacy, cultural heritage, environmental sustainability, and so on. Libraries offer space, collection, human and technical resources, and they cooperate with civil society by organizing reading meetings, collecting memories, and inviting people to contribute their knowledge to various portals such as Camera, which is cultural heritage portal, and Faces of Slovenian Regions, which is online bibliographical lexicon. How can libraries incorporate active citizenship into their existing services and programs, such as workshops, discussion groups, or community events? Yes, uh, by providing opportunities for people to learn about, discuss, and act on civic issues that affect their lives and communities. For example, libraries can host community debates. Libraries can facilitate dialogue among diverse groups of people on topics of public interest, such as democracy, human rights, social justice, or environmental sustainability. Libraries can use various formats and methods such as book clubs, film screenings, panel discussions or forums to encourage uh, respectful and informed exchange of views and per, uh, perspectives. 
Libraries can also collaborate with NGOs or move, movements that work on civic issues such as voter education, civic literacy, advocacy, or volunteering. Libraries, libraries can offer their space and resources to support their activities and programs, and also connect library users with opportunities to get involved and make a difference. Libraries can promote cultural diversity in their communities and foster intercultural dialogue and understanding. Libraries can organize events and exhibitions that highlight the heritage, traditions, languages, and expression of different groups, and also provide access to diverse and inclusive collection and resources. They can help people develop the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary for active citizenship, such as critical thinking, media literacy, human rights awareness, or civic participation. Uh, they can offer workshop courses or online, pl online platforms that cover their topics and also provide access to reliable and relevant information sources on civic issues. Are there any collaborative projects or partnerships that libraries can engage in to enhance their efforts in promoting active citizenship? There are probably many collaborative projects and partnership that, partnerships that uh, libraries can engage in promoting active citizenship. Uh, I am aware of next examples. Uh, for the first thing um, is, of course, Erasmus Plus Partnership for Cooperation, which are projects that enable participating uh, organization to gain experience in international cooperation and to strengthen their capacities. Uh, the next one is uh, Occupy Library Network, which is a community of uh, practice that support public libraries as hubs of active citizenship. This network provides opportunities for learning, sharing, and collaborating among libraries and other stakeholders who are interested in developing civic uh, competencies and fostering social change. And the most important for um, our library um, is um, that libraries should follow an international and non-for-profit association, Public Libraries 2030, and become involved as a lighthouse library. Uh, PL 2030 is driven by the vision of a world where public libraries are a dynamic and inclusive space accessible to all that connects with local citizen and global concerns. What strategies can libraries employ to raise awareness and educate their leaders about the importance of active citizenship and their role in democratic processes? Uh, leaders must be aware of uh, vital, uh, vital role libraries have in civic engagement and education for citizenship. First of all, they must be aware of and understand what is civic literacy and social responsibility. They are related but distinct concepts. Uh, I will quote this uh, from internet. Uh, civic literacy refers to the knowledge and skills that enable people to participate effectively in democratic processes and civic life. It includes understanding how government works, what rights and responsibilities citizens have, how to access and evaluate information sources and how to communicate and collaborate with others. On the other side, social responsibility refers to the attitudes and values that motivate people to care about the common good and contribute to society. It includes being aware of social issues and problems, being empath empathetic and respectful of diverse perspectives, being willing to take action for positive change and being accountable for one's actions. 
Civic literacy and social responsibility are both important for developing active and engaged citizens who can make informed and ethical decisions. How can libraries leverage digital platforms and technologies to facilitate active citizenship and expand their reach to a broader audience? Uh, for example, libraries can use digital platforms to provide access to diverse and reliable information sources that support informed decision making and critical thinking to co collaborate with other institutions and organizations that promote democratic values and practices, to develop programs and services that foster information literacy, civic literacy, and social responsibility among library users, and to advocate for the public interest and to common good in the face of challenges such as polarization, misinformation, fake news, and inequality. Are there founding opportunities or grants available to libraries that specifically support initiatives related to active citizenship and civic engagement? Yes, there are founding opportunities or grants available to libraries that support active citizenship and civic engagement. But I know just, for example, Erasmus Plus partnership, as I already mentioned, uh, and uh, maybe I will um, also say that we know one very interesting foundation. It is called the European Challenge. That program is supported by European Cultural Foundation. It is an annual program for libraries and their communities to design, test and deliver solutions to local problems that can benefit all of Europe. Our library participated in the first year of founding. What evaluation methods or indicators can libraries use to measure the impact and effectiveness of their active citizenship programs and how can they adapt and improve based on feedback and outcomes? Uh, libraries can use different methods like a uh, mixed method uh, that uh, integrates members, library and external perspectives, uh, other users to evaluate their programs. Libraries can use both uh, quantitative and qualitative methods such as surveys, interviews, focus groups, observation, document analysis and case studies. They can also use a participatory action research approach that involves, involves more or less youth as co-researchers and co-evaluators of library programs. This approach can help libraries to empower youth as active citizens to generate re relevant and meaningful data and to foster collaborative learning and improvement. Libraries can use methods such as photo voice, storytelling, mapping, and digital media. And there is also a um, logic model that specifies the inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts of their programs. This model can help libraries to clarify their goals and objectives, to identify relevant indicators and measures, and to access their progress and achievements. Libraries can use methods such as performance indicators, outcome indicators, impact indicators, and uh, satisfaction, satisfaction indicators. Thank you for your ideas and thoughts, and all the best with your future projects. The European Green Deal is a set of policy initiatives proposed by the European Commission in December 2019 to make Europe climate neutral to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050. Its goal is to make the Union's economy sustainable, turning climate and environmental challenges into opportunities and ensuring a fair and inclusive energy transition. 
libraries provide a vast array of resources on renewable energy, climate change and sustainable practices. They empower citizens with knowledge to understand environmental challenges and solutions and actively help reduce consumerism and promote sustainable consumer practices by encouraging book borrowing instead of buying. Many libraries have already embraced green spaces and gardening initiatives. They cultivate community gardens, offer seed sharing programs and provide resources on sustainable agriculture and such activities are only going to increase in the future to make Green Deal a reality. And how could a future library in 2050 look like? Libraries will offer space for sessions about gardening and sustainable living, enabling people to work and learn together in the community gardens. People will also learn new skills such as fixing bicycles and be able to borrow any sort of utensils, plants and tools from the Library of Things. Children will come to borrow toys and families will participate in clothes exchange, cooking classes or the next green initiative for the greener neighborhood. Sitzel Beck Patterson was a library transformer for 10 years and played a crucial role in the transformation of the main library in Orhaus into the renewed DOC 1, the largest public library in Scandinavia. Since 2017, she has been the head of innovation and co creation at Orhaus Public Libraries, supporting projects and promoting user involvement. She has also contributed to the development of the Design Thinking for Libraries Toolkit, a collaborative project with Chicago Public Library and IDEO aimed at understanding patrons' needs and engaging communities effectively. Welcome to our webinar. So, how can libraries integrate green practices and sustainability initiatives into their participation in the Erasmus Plus program? Well, I think libraries can work with the sustainability initiatives in many different ways. Um, I guess libraries are already in the sharing business, uh, so it's already uh, part of our DNA to do it. Um, so I think there are very many different ways to do it. And we have had here at Aarhus Public Libraries, we've spent the last uh, three years doing uh, a focus area around the SDGs to figure out what kind of things we should do. And it has been, you know, on every level uh, from hands-on workshops, activities uh, to a more strategic level where we have um, a set of um, dogmas that we follow to uh, become more green ourselves as well. What are some examples of Erasmus Plus projects that specifically promote environmental sustainability and green practices in libraries? Um, here at Aarhus Public Libraries, we have a range of different uh, examples. We have everything from, for example, some of our branch libraries that have um, library gardens. So a garden where you can borrow your own spot to, to grow things. We have lots of uh, green workshops where you can come and learn about uh, seeds and what are the plants that are um, good to grow in, in our part of the world. Um, we have uh, also had like, for example, um, uh, events where we share stuff. So for example, around Christmas, we have this uh, um, Christmas market where you're bringing all the stuff you that you don't need anymore and then people can come and pick out things and uh, give it away for Christmas gifts um, stuff like that where we put a focus on this thing about we don't have to buy more things we have already have the things we need um, we have also um, a new project coming up uh, around uh, nature connectedness because that's one of the things we have seen through many of our uh, different initiatives is that it's very important to figure out how can we become more connected uh, with nature so that's a project uh, that will put a focus on that and, and find out what role can libraries play here of course there are several other partners around out there that are working with this but what could libraries do um, we also have i would like also to mention one of 
the new project we're doing uh, that is called uh, Playing with the Sun. Uh, it's more like a, it's a project uh, that is based in our maker lab. Uh, so in that project, they put a focus on sustainable energy. So they have these small uh, solar cells that they build into small creatures and then you can bring the creatures out into the sun. And then when the sun is out, uh, these small things start to move. Um, so it's a way of thinking about how can we uh, rethink our relation to energy and start thinking about how can we use it in a different way and how can we not just, you know, use, um, there's a tendency that we just, you know, in the past years have been using all the energy we wanted, but we might have to think more about uh, doing it in a different way. Uh, so that's more like, how can we use, uh, yeah, tinkering and maker stuff to, to do that, become more green. And how can libraries leverage the Erasmus Plus program to learn from international best practices in green library management and operations? Yeah, how can libraries learn from international best practices? Um, well, our strategy in this is very much to reach out to whoever we can see out there who's doing something uh, interesting to, to learn something from them. Uh, we have uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we hosted the Next Library Conference uh, where we had sustainability as one of the three uh, main themes. Um, and that brought together library innovators from all over the world. And I think places like that are a great spot for uh, finding inspiration and best practices. So learn from each other, reach out, uh, get to know uh, people and what they do. Uh, that's more or less our strategy. We try to be curious and create some network out there uh, to get some inspiration for, for what to do. I think it's a matter of, you can't really just copy what everyone else is doing. It's also a matter of, you know, getting, getting some inspiration and then figuring out, okay, what is the best uh, thing for us to do? And I think that's very important to figure out how would, what would be the best thing for us um, to become more green or, yeah. Are there specific Erasmus Plus founding opportunities or grants available for libraries interested in imp implementing green projects or initiatives? Yeah, I would say looking at the, the funding world right now, there are uh, quite a lot of uh, opportunities if you want to do uh, projects around sustainability, about green initiatives. Um, so I would definitely say there are uh, lots of opportunities. I can't mention very many specific ones, but for example, IFLA has this, this uh, Green Library Award. That could be one thing uh, to apply for. Uh, I don't know if it gives you very much funding, but still it's a way of getting some recognition and uh, some international network. And then of course, all the um, there are different calls in, uh, in EU uh, that I would look into. So I would say there are, Quite a lot, uh, so it's, I think it's just a matter of yeah, uh, digging into them. How can libraries collaborate with other European libraries or organizations through Erasmus Plus to develop joint projects addressing environmental sustainability? Yes, again, for, for this question, I would say that it's a matter of uh, reaching out. Uh, again, at our next library conference, I uh, could see a lot of people uh, networking and sharing stuff and figuring out, okay, what can we do together uh, in this field? Uh, and of course, talking about sustainability and, and green libraries, it makes very much sense to uh, cooperate across uh, uh, borders. Um, so I think create network and we have try to form different networks. We have one international network around uh, sustainability, but we also have a Nordic uh, Green Library Network. And it's uh, not, we don't have really have that much funding for it yet, but we try to, for example, like this, uh, we have meetups uh, every month, like uh, maybe have a lunch together uh, online and then talk about, okay, what have you done? And what have you done? And have you heard about anything? Um, and then I guess at some point, one day, I'm sure that uh, we will manage to, to get some funding to do a bigger project together, but it's, uh, of course, it takes time. Um, 
So reach out and, and create network would be, again, be my best uh, advice. What resources and support are provided within the Erasmus Plus program to help libraries implement and monitor green practices effectively? Mm. I don't really have any good question answer for that mm -hmm. i would say because what resources and support are available i can't think of any we have ourselves but that's more or less it uh, and of course uh, we reach out to, to partners and people that we know uh, can help us uh, and uh, get some help in that way but that's what are some successful case studies of libraries that have incorporated green practices as a result of the um, involvement in Erasmus Plus project? Successful, it's a big, big word, uh, but uh, <laughs> I think there are many, many great uh, examples out there. We have been talking to many libraries who have done like different things around everything from uh, we visited a, a library in uh, Iceland, for example, they had this uh, fridge outside the library where you could leave the food uh, that you didn't need anymore, and then other people could pick it up. Uh, we have had um, some learning, we also heard about a, a library in Oslo, they did uh, something about a seed library uh, and some green uh, workshops uh, for the citizens. So there are so it's very many different uh, libraries out there who are doing uh, great work and starting to figure out what li uh, role could a library play here? Uh, how can we figure out what, what is exactly our special spot here? And how can we become a platform for uh, the green transition? Uh, that is what we think here in Aarhus is our special role. That is to be um, the, the citizens platform uh, for the green transition to so help the citizens become uh, greener. That is what we see as, as our special role um, in, in this field. And there are many, many libraries out there who are doing uh, great work. We also got inspiration for, for example, uh, a library in Colorado called Anything. They're thinking about building a nature library. So that's kind of one of their big projects coming up. Uh, so again, reaching out to them, learning for, uh, from them about how they do it, uh, it's great inspiration for us. So I think there are many libraries uh, out there that you could get uh, really good inspiration from. How can libraries measure and evaluate the environmental impact and outcomes of the green initiatives under the Erasmus Plus program? Um, I think that's a, it's a really good question because it's a, um, I think we have found that it is quite difficult to measure the impacts because um, you need a lot of numbers and you also know, need to know what is exactly the right things to do. Um, so we're still thinking about how can we measure the impact. The thing we often do here uh, at Osborne Libraries is that we we take a little bit more uh, qualitative approach to measurements. So instead of asking for numbers and how big is the impact, we talk to people about what kind of difference did it make for you? Did it help you create uh, new habits in your life? Or did, you, did it help you uh, create a more green uh, everyday life here in Aarhus? So the feedback we get there is of course much more like it's figure uh, data. Uh, so data that you need to digest a little bit more um, and analyze to figure out what was uh, the impact. But that would be our approach. Uh, and then get some input from the users to see uh, the citizens so that we can learn, okay, was this the right approach? Did we actually help some people here? And then uh, we use that data to um, design and redesign the next couple of initiatives that we're doing. So all the time getting this feedback from the citizens and then uh, iterate and, and start designing new things and new green initiatives that we could do. Are there any Erasmus Plus training opportunities or capacity building activities focused on promoting green practices and sustainability in libraries? I'm sure that there are 
many training opportunities here in in Denmark. We have um, a special program for libraries where you can become a sustain certified library in the sustainable uh, development goals. So that's a program that you have to go through as a library. You have to run through different things um, and then you can become certified as an uh, SDG library. So that is one of the things that you can do here in, in Denmark and I'm sure there would be other programs like that um, in other countries. Um, one of the training opportunities we um, tend to use is that we do projects uh, around green library initiatives and through those projects we learn something and we get new skills and that is the way that we kind of would like to um, yeah build new capacities uh, in relation to how can libraries effectively contribute to raising awareness and promoting environmental sustainability among their users and the broader community through Erasmus Plus project? Well, I think there are a lot of lots of things that libraries could do. Uh, we could raise uh, awareness about this question by uh, hosting all kinds of different activities. We can also be the platform for the citizens' own uh, engagement in creating a better uh, or green, greener, at least, future. Um, so the things that we do here is, for example, that we host uh, learning communities. So, so that is peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning uh, communities where people come together to learn about um, how to create a greener everyday life, how to grow things when you live in the city. Uh, so they come together to, to learn these and we are the platform for that. Um, so we are not the experts uh, and there are really no experts in this, but uh, the citizens, they come together and try to figure out how to do it together and so learn, learn new things. We have lots of workshops. Uh, I already mentioned some of them, but we also have, for example, like sewing workshops where people come together to repair stuff and learn how to sew and, and do uh, those kind of things so that we don't buy any more clothes. Uh, we have had uh, micro initiatives, like for example, uh, when we host events, if you want coffee, you have to bring your own cup. So stop using uh, these, uh, plastic cups or whatever you call them, um, uh, bring your own cup if you want uh, coffee. And that's also a signal of saying, okay, this is a space where we would like to think about this together with you, uh, with the citizens. We have um, also every year, we have something called the Children's Green Festival. And it's actually a festival that was um, created uh, by children here in Aarhus. And they wanted to, to host it at the library. So that's the day where around 500 children come together and they do lots of different activities to figure out how can we live in a more sustainable way? Um, what new ideas could we come up with? So green festivals like that. Um, we also have a, a new uh, initiative that we're doing with the, the Lego Foundation and where we at some point also would like other libraries to join in uh, and that's uh, something called build the chains where we invite people to our children to come to workshops and then build a bit of future together come up with ideas about how can we create a better um, uh, situation for uh, for example for animals and plants in the city uh, how can we think about uh, living in a more sustainable way they come up with ideas for this and they build it uh, sometimes in Lego and in, sometimes in just, you know, cardboard and stuff like that. Uh, and then they display it uh, for uh, politicians and uh, leaders uh, to inspire them to how can we uh, change the way uh, we're living. So that's another thing. So, so we, that is what we, we try to do, you know, just put a focus on every, every time we have a chance and they invite um, citizens to join in um, and co-create with them uh, to figure out how can we uh, create a better future. Thank you for your thoughts and explanations and good luck with your future projects. In conclusion, this webinar has provided valuable insights into EU founding opportunities for libraries, highlighting the importance of aligning with the European Union's priorities in digitalization 
active citizenship, inclusion and the Green Deal. By embracing these priorities and showcasing their impact, libraries can position themselves as strong candidates for EU founding programs, ultimately enhancing their services, fostering innovation and making a positive impact on their communities. Thank you for your attention.